Okay, carrying on with uh, the prosopranx and the subclasses, uh, mesogastropods and neogastropods. We finished archaeogastropods, so now we move to the move to the middle gastropods and new gastropods, meso and neo. And so these are um, structurally derived from the archaeogastropods, and so we're going through the evolutionary um, uh, development of gastropods, and we'll see some of the features that are different in these ones that have allowed them to radiate out to unexploited habitats. Um, so what they've done that's a little bit different is they've changed from a bipectinate gill that we looked at before that was like a feather structure and now they have a monopectinate gill which is like a one-sided feather so all the uh, little um, uh, the little striations that come off of the feather are only on one side so like a comb and they also have developed a siphon so how, let's have a look at these two structures and why they're important if I can get my PowerPoint working here we go so this is what you would call and this is a neogastropod and we're not really going to distinguish distinguish between the mesogastropods and neogastropods except to note that they um, the because they're very similar so we're looking at the, the archaeogastropods are the older um, and rock uh, hard sediment bound uh, grazers and now we have a lot of um, a few grazers scavengers and uh, but mostly predators and scavengers okay so here's a neogastropod and if you look at the um, shell and the um, animal then what you'll see is one of the main things that you see is this thing called a siphon okay and this you can see is just a fold in the mantle tissue so if you um, if you look at it closely you'll see that that fold allows for essentially a tube to be formed and that tube is where water is sucked in that's why it's called a siphon okay, just like a, if you siphon gas out of a car so the, water is sucked in through this uh, tube this fold in the mantle and um, this area is just packed with sensory um, tissue so like like uh, like the funk like your smell sense of smell and so um, these things have very good smell and the reason is so they can smell their way towards prey or towards dead uh, material if they are a scavenger and some of these of course will be predatory or scav or scavenge they'll be opportunist feeders and um, so that has led to what we call a siphonal notch and here we or a siphonal canal and so these are extreme versions of the siphonal canal and so you can see this long tube which is protective of that uh, siphon the fold in the mantle tissue so this is to keep it from being nipped off and here's a one off of a penion whelk uh, this one here is called a um, snipe billed murex and this one is a penion whelk which is a local one but in both of them you can see how this long funnel has developed and in a grazer like a cat's eye you'll see that it's got this opening the aperture is round and no siphonal notch, no siphonal canal coming down at the opening at the aperture of the of the shell. And so if you with a very few exceptions, very, very few exceptions, if you see the siphonal canal, then you know that you're looking at a predator or a scavenger. And if you see if you don't see a siphonal canal, then you know you're looking at a grazer. Okay, so one of the diagnostic tools of a um, uh, looking at gastropods. Also, okay, so the um, uh, oh, this is that. Well, here we go. This is a um, wordy explanation of what we were just talking about. All right, so these things allowed greater uh, range of habitats, burrowing, uh, freshwater, and terrestrial habitat exploitation.
So neogastropods, most species are, uh, they will copulate rather than broadcast spawn. And they have internal fertilization, which is uh, something we haven't seen in um, many of the other phyla that we've looked at. Deposit eggs within well-developed envelopes or cases, and then these hatch into uh, uh, villagers, which for our larval, uh, larval distribution, for larval distribution, in the water column or they develop directly into juveniles. So here would be a land snail and of course these ones are not villagers, they'll de develop directly into villagers, but this is what you're more likely to see in the uh, open, in the uh, marine ecosystem is when you see a whelk or a um, uh, neogastropod egg case then it'll look something like this. Okay, so each of these little uh, compartments will contain one uh, egg that will grow into uh, a larva or a new um, adult snail. Guys, okay, so might be something like this. Might be something like this. You see these washed up occasionally, and there are just egg cases. So you'll see, you come across these quite a bit. Often people don't really know what they are, and uh, so egg cases are um, what they what they are. Okay, so the subclass Opistobranchia. Bubble snails, snails, sea hares, nudibranchs, and sea slugs. So this is another subclass of gastropods. Um, and generally, these things don't have a shell, um, uh, but a few do. But they they tend to be very reduced. Um, and these ones have a second pair of tentacles called the rhinophores, which we'll look at a little closer. And those are surrounded. Um, at the base by these little folds, which is a, one of the diagnostic features. We'll have a good close look at those. And they tend to be grazers on sponges, hydroids, and other inverts. Which and uh, So these sponges and hydroids obviously have nasty um, chemical defenses and um, ni nidocytes, and so these things have to be, uh, have a lot of specializations for feeding on these dangerous uh, toxic other or, uh, organisms, animals. Okay, so here we go. Bubble snails. They've got a thin shell, which you can, um, which is sometimes transparent. It's so thin, uh, and they, the mantle comes over and folds over the, um, over the shell. Often can be found plowing under the surface of the mud, like a little miniature barrel snail, but they're. Uh, or like an olive shell, uh, but they're generally a bit larger, half inch or so, uh, so uh, a couple of centimeters long generally. Um, and sometimes you see these things um, with their jelly-like egg masses uh, or laid on seaweeds growing on the surface of the mud, so they're like um, big bubbly, uh, big bubbly sort of um, uh, goopy, soupy uh, egg masses. Okay, and here is a sea hare. Okay, and these things, uh, the name sort of derives from these projections, like right here, that look a bit like rabbit ears. Uh, they're sort of large, bulky creatures. They're a bit bigger than your average nudibranch. They'll be sort of um, 75 centimeters up to 10. Uh, or sorry, 75 uh, millimeters, seven and a half centimeters, uh, to maybe 10 centimeters long. Sometimes they can weigh up to a couple of kilos, um, so they can get even a bit bigger than the uh, than the 10 centimeters or so. Soft bodies. Um, they have an internal shell, which is very reduced, and um, they're hermaphrodites all the time, whereas most of the other ones are uh, dioecious. And you can see this picture. Um, I saw my first couple of these on uh, Great Barrier Island underneath uh, some mussel farms this summer. Uh, but you can see the this little bit of sort of smoke. It's a lot like um, squid ink or something, but that's a noxious sort of chemical that's that's um, emitted when they're bothered. And if you ever find one of these things and you poke it, you'll find that these this purple smoke sort of wafts away, and that's something to deter predators. It's just noxious. Okay. 
And then we come to nudibranchs, which um, are a lot of people's favorites. They're beautiful little creatures, come in lots and lots and lots of varieties. Um, and, but you'll see the diagnostic features of these ones are they tend to have a gill uh, that's external, and then these other things called rhinophores. All right, so uh, we'll have a quick look at those. Again, so these nudibranchs come in all sorts of colors, um, but generally they have the two um, antenna, which are rhinophores that come up here, and then lots of uh, external gills okay, at the back. And here we go, here's a rhinophores. So if we look um, at these images, so rhinophore, rhino. Okay, from the Greek for nose, like we talked about before, and four, uh, okay, P-H-O, you might think it's poor like a hole, but four is carrier, okay, and um, so it tells you that it's a smell carrier. So if we look at this organism, which is a luna moth, and we know that luna moths have, um, are pretty much the adults hatch, never feed, live for a couple of weeks, and their primary goal is to find a mate. So these males will be able, be able to find the scent of a female from up to a mile away, and they can, fo they can follow that scent with these very, very sensitive um, uh, antennae that are made for collecting scents. So again, we, with lots of surface area, and again, we see the same sort of structure in the rhinophores of a nudibranch, and um, so you can imagine that this is an analog that um, is designed for catching scents. So essentially, it's the smell organ. Um, nudibranchs, okay, they make that means naked gills, and they don't have a shell, a mantle cavity, uh, or the original gill. They are sometimes can be. Uh, covered by serrata, which are sort of lots of projections, like if you use, uh, see a um, Jason's nudibranch. You know, some of you may have seen those at uh, at the um, Mary Warrior growing on the on the Nidarian trees, the hydroid trees, and often brilliantly colored. And this is um, to advertise the fact that they'll either uh, be very poisonous or they can contain uh, nematocysts. So amaz amazingly, these things can graze on hydrozoans uh, or even other um, or even um, anemones, and then somehow, when they eat the uh, nidocytes, they can chemically suppress those from firing, eat them, have them migrate from their digestive tract intact so that the um, the cell itself is not digested it migrates intact through the tissue of the uh, of the nudibranch and sits on the surface of the nudibranch ready to be a chemic a, uh, a defense ready to be fired at a prey item or uh, sorry a predator of the nudibranch so it's really an incredible uh, incredible defense mechanism and obviously very complicated. Um, so these things are either um, hermaphrodites simultaneously or first one sex then the other. They, they all copulate. They um, have internal fertilization and then deposit eggs and sometimes you'll see these rose shaped uh, egg cases and we'll have a look at those in uh, lab or uh, hopefully I can point some out while we're diving, but um, these rose uh, flowers of eggs that um, you'll come across quite often. And then, so they either will develop directly or um, have a villager stage like we saw before. Okay, so here we go. Here are these serrata on the back, and uh, or they'll have gills, and they're all for gas exchange. Okay. Another subclass in gastropods is pulmonata. Okay, these are the air-breathing snails, and mostly freshwater. So all freshwater snails will have um, 
will, will be pulmonata, or I'm sorry, freshwater and the terrestrial. Uh, but there are, uh, and so in order to um, be able to do gas exchange without gills, they've got a um, area of very, very vascular skin that's sort of like a lung that they hold within the mantle cavity, and these things don't have any operculum. So the um, one marine snail that is a gastropod, or that, sorry, that is a pulmonate or a pulmonata, uh, and the only reason that we're mentioning pulmonata is amphibola crenata. So that one is a um, is a air breathing snail. So they just have to hide and um, not breathe um, when they are underwater, and then they come up and feed when the tide is out, which is, makes them quite different from most other snails. But they also have an operculum, uh, which is, makes them different from other pulmonates. Okay. And we'll just skip over that. Here's a Pau elephanta. It's a carnivorous land snail. It's very big and one of the larger snails in the world. And um, But they are now... Well, they can they're now endangered. These things can grow um, as large as a fist and weigh as much as a tui. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll look at how these things eat. And they do eat generally with a, uh, just like most, most gastro, or most, um, mollusks. They have this thing called a radula. And here you can see, I'm not sure if we mentioned the radula in an earlier video, but you can see that this is what uh, what it is. It's a tongue with lots and lots of little teeth on it that scrapes away at the algae. So they'll just come in and just scrape, scrape, scrape at the at the surface. So here you go. You can imagine these things scraping into, um, away at algae that's encrusting uh, uh, something or if there's a bit of um, like a if they're a scavenger and they find something dead, they can just rasp this along the top of it and they just um, uh, pull all the p chunks that these little teeth pull off of that meat into their mouth and then they swallow it. Okay, we're going to stop here and then we'll go on to bivalves in the next video.